Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture, and our topic today is human dignity. And our guest is Daniel Darling, who is, and I'm reading this right off the cover of the book, Vice President for Communications for the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. I always have to stop and pause when I think about the commission because of the, the nature of the name. But, uh, and, uh, and Dan, thank you for being a part of The, of the Table today. Well, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Uh, someone who's admired your work for a long time and a fan of what you're doing here uh, with the table. Well, thanks. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about how you got to to doing this book, but let's start first with your background and how you ended up being connected to the commission. Where does, what, tell us a little bit about your personal story. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. You know, I um, uh, grew up in church. I and, you know, I, I pastored a church um, in the Chicago area uh, for uh, almost six years. And uh, I've been a writer and editor for a long t- time. You know, I've been writing for Christian Today, the Gospel Coalition, uh, writing op-eds for different places. Um, and I, uh, I had known Dr. Moore, Russell Moore, who he became president in 2013, of the president of the commission. And uh, I had interviewed him for CT once he got the position. He had endorsed one of my books, uh, and we had gone back and forth. I was a huge fan of the way he engages politics and the culture and was really grateful that he got hired for this position. Then they reached out to me in 2013, and I was really just thought it was a great opportunity to come and work for someone and to really have a chance to really help equip Christians and how we think through uh, all these real, you know, difficult issues that are uh, of face us. How do we apply the gospel to the culture? I've always had, in my mind, I've always had a love for politics and history and cultural stuff and public policy, and I've always had a deep love for the church. And so I really feel like I get to do both things here, uh, be in the church and helping church leaders, uh, being involved in my local church, but also engaging public policy at a national level. So it's, it's really the best of both worlds, if you will. Well, let's talk a little bit about what you do there. So it, it says you're, um, what, um, vice president for communications, the vice president part I get, but what does it mean to be uh, dealing with communications for the Ethics and Religious Liberty uh, Commission? That's a good question. I mean, what it means really is that, um, you know, I, I manage all of our content, uh, so I have a team, great team that works for me and manage all of our content, whether it's our web content, our publications, podcasts, um, you know, any of our creative stuff. We do uh, quite a few events and conferences and kind of leaning into some of the content and creative for that. And then just serving on the executive team, helping to shape the future uh, of the organization. And so, um, and then I do a fair amount of speaking and writing, uh, representing the ERLC in different places as well. So what's the calling of the commission in general? I actually think some people may or may not be aware of that. So what, is the, what does the commission seek to do? That's a great question. I, I tell people uh, we have two roles. First, we speak for Southern Baptists and really conservative evangelicals in the public square on issues of public policy. So we have a pretty robust presence in D.C. We're working with the administration. We're working with Congress, think tanks, and um, the media and all, all sorts of things that kind of shape the, the debate about important issues like religious liberty, like human dignity, pro-life issues, uh, religious persecution overseas, religious liberty here, uh, a wide range of issues, criminal justice reform, all kinds of things. Uh, we speak for Southern Baptists, but then we also speak to Southern Baptists. We try to equip pastors and church leaders how to think through moral and ethical issues, how to apply the gospel of the kingdom to the culture. So we host a number of events, and we have content, we have books that we publish, and magazines, and all sorts of things, really trying to uh, help equip past church leaders to, to then lead their congregations uh, to apply the gospel of the kingdom to uh, to the world in which they're called. Now, this might seem like a strange question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So, uh, is, is the commission sometimes misunderstood for what it, it is about and what it's doing? Uh, are there 
uh, because it seems to me that you're kind of a, uh, as you've communicated, kind of a two-way communication stream, both into what's going on um, there. I'm, I'm assuming you're located in Washington, D.C., uh, located in, in, Nashville. And in Nashville. So so the Southern Baptist headquarters on the one hand and, and obviously the capital of the states on the other. Um, and yet at the same time, you're also trying to help churches kind of understand the environment in which we're functioning in at the same time. Yeah, we are. And I think, um, you know, Richard Land, who was the previous president, said it really well, I think, on the floor of the convention this year. He <laughs> The year also has a really important task. We, we speak for Southern Baptists, but he said, sometimes we call, you're called to speak to us and challenge us to think biblically about all kinds of moral and ethical issues. And, uh, you know, today I think it's really important that Christians um, think well about the world in which they live. Uh, we're too easily, um, I would say, catechized by other voices and other influences, whether it's left or right. Uh, we're too easily shaped by our favorite pundits or uh, talk radio or our that crazy uncle on Facebook or something, instead of allowing the gospel to shape the way we see things. So you all are focused on trying to think through the ethical dimensions of what the gospel is about in relationship to mainly, is it public policy that, that you work with? Well, it's a range of things. It's public policy, but also even the Christian life. You know, we, we talk a lot about parenting. We talk a lot about ethical and moral leadership in the church. Uh, what does that look like? Uh, we talk about, you know, sort of bioethics and, and some of those reproductive technologies. Uh, so there, there's a public policy dimension, but there's also a personal dimension. And, uh, you know, we have pastors that are asking us all the time, how do I talk to this um, couple about this issue that's come up? Or how do I deal with this teenager that has this issue? Uh, and so just really, really a range of things. Okay, well, let's let's turn our attention now to talking uh, about uh, the book. It's called The Dignity Revolution, and the subtitle is Reclaiming God's Rich Vision for Humanity. So um, uh, what caused you uh, to write uh, The cover is really fascinating. Let me show it up here. It's kind of got this range of variety of faces and looks without eyes or nose or or ears or mouth but you can tell you've got the faces of people on the cover um so um so let's let's talk about what caused you to write this book well a couple things i mean first i've always been fascinated by by the way that the bible describes humanity i mean just from the opening pages of genesis you have moses he's you know narrating the creation of the world, and he's talking about how God spoke into existence all the natural world. But then when he when he describes the way that God forms humans, he it's like he pauses and he stops and reaches for very rich language. He says that God essentially reaches with his hands and sculpts humans from the dust of the ground and breathes into them the breath of life. And then, of course, humans bear the image of God. So there's some way in which that humans reflect God in the world. And then you see King David saying, every human being is knit with care and intentionality in the mother's womb. And uh, it's just so such a rich description. I, I think human dignity is one of Christianity's best gifts to the world. So I've always been fascinated by that. And then secondly, you know, I, uh, as I've engaged um, politics and policy and all these issues, you know, I got into politics in many ways because of the pro-life movement, which really has, I think, given us a moral vocabulary to say that the most vulnerable among us, there, there's a person there, there's a clump of, it's not a clump of tissues, it's not cells, it's a human being. And I've been thinking in the last few years, what if we applied that ethic to other areas of life, to other issues like immigration, like, you know, the way even that we engage issues online and the way we talk about people. And so I really wanted to kind of think through what does it look like to have a uh, fully formed ethic of human dignity. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the thing I love about the creation is man is so important or humanity is so important that we actually tell the story twice, you know. Um, we have the creation of Adam and Eve in the image Absolutely. of God. And, you know, you think yeah. And, th and then turn and, and if have a detailed look at Adam and Eve. Go ahead. 
Oh, absolutely. You're absolutely right. It mentions it twice. And if you think about it, um, you know, compared to, and I'm not a scholar, an Old Testament scholar like uh, uh, many of the folks at Dallas Seminary, but I do know that the way that Genesis describes humans uh, is just, I think, different than even other ancient Near East uh, descriptions of, of humanity. And, you know, he, Genesis tells us two things about what it means to be human. It tells us first that we're not God, that we're created by God, we're created by a creator, but we're also not animals either, that we're not beasts. And so there's something distinct about being human. Yeah, and there's a there's a consciousness about being a human and our place in the creation that I think uh, I, I tease people that I never hear anyone talk about the First Baptist Church of Bears or the First Presbyterian Church of Dolphins, you know that um, that that there there's a consciousness about the nature of life, the nature of time, the nature of the past, present, and future. Uh, that we don't see in the rest of the creation. And, of course, humans were given the responsibility to be stewards to manage the creation. I often say to my students there was a concept of theology that I didn't think much about the first 20 years I was teaching, and that's the concept of stewardship or management, which actually is one of the core responsibilities a human being is given in the creation story. We're called to subdue the earth, which means to manage it and steward it well as male and female from the very beginning. That's a calling every human being participates in from God. And so that kind of sets the direction for for both who we are and what we should be doing. That's absolutely right. In fact, you know, if I really feel it's important in this age, especially for Christians to recover a robust vision of human dignity, because I think it affects not just the way we see ourselves, I think it does when it comes to our identity, the way we interact with technology, and the way we project ourselves online and a a wide range of things, but also the way we see our neighbors, right? That, uh, as C.S. Lewis said, you've never met a mere mortal, that, you know, if we truly understand every person is created in the image of God, it really affects the way we think about a lot of different things. And so uh, I really wanted to set forth a readable, understandable sort of theology of what it means to be human. So would it be fair to say that one of your goals is to have people appreciate how every human being made in the image of God is sacred? Yes, I would say that. Um, and, and sacred in the sense of, and I even have a chapter in there on self-worship. I think there's there's really two choices that every human being has. We can either, as an image bearer of God, we can turn upward in worship and live out our calling as image bearers, or we can turn in inward in self-worship. And this is why you see the Old Testament after Genesis, like 9, doesn't use image of God language, but starts to talk about idolatry. And there's a reason for that, because the tendency in a fallen world is for us to create our own images that we then worship as reflections of us, rather than us serving as reflections of God. Um, and that leads to all sorts of, you know, uh, corruption in the world and, and, and violence against our fellow image bearers and all sorts of things. But we do have the good news that Jesus uh, completes as the second Adam what the first Adam could not do. He is the fullest vision of what it means to be human. Not only that, he restores our image-bearing purposes. He, he restores our humanity. Uh, I think that when you look at Ephesians 2.10, essentially saying that God is restoring in Christ our orig- the original reason for which we were created. So I think the, the, the Bible gives us the the most fullest vision of what it means to be human and how to rescue our humanity. Hmm. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about the contents of the book. Um, uh, And that is, first, you have a section called Finding Dignity. Um, And and I take it you're trying to encourage people here to realize who God has made them to be and, and who God has made their neighbor to be at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. I really wanted to flesh out in the first chapter what it means to be created in the image of God and and really understanding what that is. There's a lot of mystery there. We don't understand all of it. Even the most, you know, uh, the best scholars haven't fully mined the depths of what that means. But at the very least, it means that there's some way in which we image God and represent God in the world. Um, and I think there's a there's a structural and a functional aspect to, to being made in the image of God. Structural means that no matter who we we are, what our utility is, what we've done, even in a fallen world, we still bear the full image of God, right? 
nobody has less of the image of God. And that, but, but there's also a functional part of being an image bearer, which means that we have responsibility, that we were made by a creator to uh, reflect him and to live out our purposes, as you said, by stewarding the earth, by subduing the raw materials that God has given us, by creating, by innovating. Uh, and so just trying to get people to understand what that, what that fully means. So, um, so in, in, the, in the principle that you have, every person has dignity on the one hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the other hand, people have a there, – there's a sacredness to life that we are supposed to respect. And you've made the point earlier, you respect that not only for the, the developing child in a womb, but you're supposed to respect that all the way through the cycles of life. In mm-hmm. fact, I, I sense that what you've done in the book by its structure is to actually kind of walk us through a series of, of different uh, contexts or spaces, I like to call them, um, where where dignity shows itself and where issues of dignity impact the way we see the issues that are in front of us. So out of this dignity comes a way of thinking about how we relate to the people around us. That's exactly right. I mean, it affects all sorts of issues. And so uh, the way we think about race, and you know, I think of Martin Luther King using always the language of human dignity in his speeches as if to say to the white supremacists, can you not just see me as a human being, as a full human being? I think of him marching in Memphis with the sanitation workers and those sandwich board signs that said, I am a man. In other words, can you look at me as not just a cog in the machine, but as a full human being? So you talk about race, we talk about how should we think about immigration, about criminal justice reform, how should we think about poverty, technology, um, life and death issues, health care. Uh, there's, there's kind of a range of things that kind of apply this to. And the point, another point that I would guess you're making is this is not a matter of political ideology. This is a matter of core theology and anthropology. It really is. And in fact, if you really have a fully robust vision of human dignity, it will disrupt your politics mm-hmm. and our tribal affiliation. And so, you know, we have to make voting decisions. I vote, you know, I voted this week. Uh, we have to join institutions. But if we have a robust vision of human dignity, we should recognize that there's no one party or no one institution that fully, fully um, cares about human dignity. Some one party on the one hand may really see dignity in the immigrant, in the, in the impoverished. Uh, another party may see dignity in the unborn. And so, you know, I think neither party has a sort of monopoly on it. And it kind of shapes the way we think about politics and, and uh, hopefully can change uh, these institutions for the better. Now, sometimes we'll talk about the difference between what I call civic religion, which is dressing up a particular uh, national orientation around uh, descriptions that tie those institutions to God in one way or another, where the real support is, the primary support comes from what the nation is, from from Christian discipleship, which is which is a, a generic view of God's kingdom that's multinational, multiracial, et cetera, and has a sense of the priority being what God asks of us um, uh, transnationally, if I can say it that way. Um, and, and, and across various ethnic divides. And so um, what I'm hearing you say is, is that when you get a, a robust view of dignity, you're asking questions from a slightly different angle than you might ask them if you were just asking them as a citizen of a country. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think we, we are citizens of America. I mean, I'm a proud American. I love our country. I love reading about our history. But ultimately, we're citizens of the kingdom of God. I think of what Peter says in First Peter, that we're sojourners and strangers. In fact, this week I just preached on Jacob, you know, in Genesis 47, saying, I'm a sojourner and stranger. We're, we're a people on the move. And as strangers and foreigners, um, even though we have to join parties and institutions and uh, that are imperfect, we should never be fully at home in any earthly institution. There should always be a little dissonance between our our temporary home here and the home we're looking forward to. We should always be, and, and I think if we're not, if we're fully at home in a party or a movement, it could be that our allegiance is 
more to that movement than to the kingdom of God. So, so being a Christian should always make us a little uncomfortable pushing against, you know, the sort of status quo of whatever tribe we're from. Um, does, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And 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 so as a result, we we ask questions from angles in which we see what I would call the legitimate tensions in a fallen world. Mm-hmm. That oftentimes we live in, in imperfect spaces, if I can say it yeah. that way, and and where where there's a push and a pull between a variety of forces, and some of that push is well motivated, but out of balance, that push can also create an imbalance that needs a correction from another thing. And and let's let's dive into the immigration discussion because I think that's one where you see this pretty. Uh, visibly. On the one hand, uh, it's perfectly appropriate for a nation to ask, what kind of people do we want to be? Mm-hmm. Uh, we want our laws to be followed. We want to be a place uh, that has order. Uh, if you have lawlessness, that doesn't, that doesn't work as a society. Um, you have a right to define uh, what kind of people you're going to be, that kind of thing. That, those are just basic nationhood kinds of questions. Um, that's one side of the equation. But on the other side of the equation is there are these texts in Scripture that talk about uh, having a sense of compassion for the foreigner and for having and, and just uh, loving people in general. I mean, it's part of the great commandment. You're supposed to love everybody, that kind of thing. So you're asking those kinds of questions and how you've got the golden rule, you know, treat the way, treat people the way you would like to be treated, that kind of thing. And sometimes those two things, both of which at one level are very well motivated, each for their own reasons, rub against each other. And you have to ask the question, how do I balance these two things? How do I put both of these things in place? And sometimes, at least what I sense we sometimes get into in some of our discussions is, we get people who will pick one side of that conversation or the other side of that conversation and not think about about the other element, if you will. And so we never discuss the relationship between those two pieces that needs a balance between them, and we just pick one side or the other, what I call cherry picking. And uh, uh, and in the process, an imbalance, we we risk an imbalance. So um, speak into how dignity uh, walks into the immigration discussion as you see it. Yeah, I mean, immigration is a very, you know, it's a complex issue. Uh, And as you said, you know, the Bible does task, you know, the government with the flourishing of its citizens. And part of that, you know, they they have, you know, the government does not bear the sword in vain. They they are tasked, I mean, a a responsible government cannot take in everybody. They have to have a border. They have to have, you know, uh, verification and and all kinds of systems in place to keep people safe. Um, And so... You know, because we believe Romans 13, we believe we believe that that's the government's role on the one hand. On the other hand, the Bible does talk uh, about nations, not just individuals, but na- nations' responsibilities to keep the poor and the foreigner, the stranger in their midst. Uh, the Bible, you know, if you read the prophets, judges the nations quite a bit for the way they treat the poor, the stranger, the immigrant. And so I think um, one of the things we have to ask ourselves is... Uh, you know, in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, um, we can't take in all the world's vulnerable. We have to guard our borders. We have to be safe. But surely we can do more than we are. Surely we can take in more people than than uh, we do now. And I think what is needed is for responsible people to say, you know, th- there's incentive on both sides for this thing not to be solved, you know, for both sides to be able to use it in campaigns. And so I think responsible people have to say, I'm going to reject the policy, on the one hand, the sort of like, let's not have any borders, let's abolish ICE, let's just, you know, everyone walk in, kumbaya, that's not going to work. On the other hand, you know, the kind of um, fear-based, you know, demagoguing of immigrants as, you know, every immigrant is a threat, every immigrant's a potential terrorist kind of language that I think in many ways is dehumanizing and really like come together and say, what can we do to our system. And good Christians are going to disagree on the exact levels of immigrants that should be here, how we should do border security. You know, those are matters of prudence, right? But I think what isn't debatable is the way we talk about immigrants, the way that Christians should language. You know, when we use like euphemisms that kind of dehumanize them, you know, um, 
every immigrant's a terrorist or, you know, we call them invaders or we call them you know, sort of anchor babies or things like that, where we, f we forget that, that, that vulnerable, those vulnerable people that are trying to get into the United States are people created in the image of God who have as much value and worth as I do, who probably want the same things for their family that I do. So what's the best way to, to approach this problem? is really how we need to think through that. And so the the dignity issue means that the person and the problem, both, are treated with a kind of respect that it deserves. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, we need to be wary of a kind of um, fear of the other. Like, if our when we're talking about immigration, if it's, you know, worried that, you know, different people groups are moving into our neighborhood or things like that, that's not something a Christian should really fear because, you know, the the Bible says in Acts that God sovereignly appoints the movement of people, you know, that as as people who love the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, it's an opportunity when the nations come to our doorstep that we can love them, because we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves, and many of them are fellow Christians. Uh, and it's also an opportunity, if they're not believers, to obey the Great Commandment, to reach out to them. We're not going to share the gospel with people that we don't first love. If we view people as a threat, we're not going to evangelize them. And so I think it really is a kind of reordering of our priorities. Interesting. So um, what, what what other issues do you find uh, kind of walk into this similar space where you've got two sets of concerns that are kind of rubbing against each other? And the issue is wrestling through, how do you, how do you balance these these concerns in a way that makes sense. My, my premise is, is that what we do when we cherry pick is we actually rob ourselves of the discussions that we need to have about what the relationship is between these pieces, both of which belong in the discussion. And we also, in the process, um, uh, create, uh, cr create an environment in which we make it hard to have those discussions because we, we end up picking sides and viewing one pole as so defining that the other almost doesn't even exist. You know, I think there's a lot of issues like that. I mean, some issues are, are less one side against the other. So when you think about technology and the way that, you know, we're asking ourselves questions about what it means to be human or think of care of the elderly or things like that. But there are some questions, like you said, that pull at both sides of it. I think of the issue of criminal justice reform. You know, if you have a robust vision of human dignity, you're going to see uh, you, you know, that we not only see dignity for um, the the um, incarcerated, but we also see dignity for the victim. And a, and a good justice system says that, you know, we have a system that, that um, respects the rights of victims by punishing crime. Uh, you know, we, we punish crime because we're saying that to... to um, commit a crime against somebody else is to assault their dignity, right? So to steal their stuff or to assault them physically is to is an assault on their dignity. Therefore, that needs to be punished. Uh, on the other hand, we also think about prisoners, and, and Chuck Colson really taught us this so well, that we, we need a justice system that sees the whole humanity of the person who's accused, that we want to find ways in a, a justice system that rehabilitates them, that can restore them, that sees them as a whole person, not just the sum total of their crimes, and yet also, because they're human, holds them accountable uh, before God or before before the state for the things that they've done. And so I think that allows us, that sort of balance allows us to both punish those who commit crimes, but also do it in a way that results in, in rehabilitation and, and having people become productive citizens again. What are, what are some of the, this question just popped in my head. What are some of the things like you felt like you learned writing the book? You know, I learned quite a bit. You know, I read a lot about human dignity. Um, and really, one of the things that was really just interesting to me is just how, how, you know, if you really understand this, it really affects everything you see. So, for instance, um, I have a chapter in here about sort of the end of life and sort of the way we the way that we see the way that we value people so uh, most of us listening to this podcast would be dead set against something like euthanasia where where we basically say uh, that people at the end of their life their life's not valuable anymore and we should find ways to help them end their lives well the answer to that obviously is 
you know, you, God sees you as an image bearer regardless of your utility. So if you're young and healthy or if you're, uh, you know, you have no cognitive ability at the end of your life, you're still a full human being, a full image bearer, and God assigns you value. And it, because we're accountable to God, he's the one who's the author of our days. Um, but also, uh, we may be against that, but even sometimes in the way our churches um, send the message that we only value the young, the sexy, the appealing, you know, look, look, at, look at the people who, who get on stage at conferences, look at the way that we market our churches, are we telling people that you're only valuable if you're one of the cool people? One of the, and, and really, in the kingdom of God, should be the opposite. That when people walk into our doors, they should be valued because they're a human being, creating the image of God, not because of what they can bring to our church. You know, this is what James is getting at by saying, "Hey, don't val- just value someone because they have money and wealth. Value everybody, whether they're poor or they're rich." Um, I think of a guy in my church right now who has severe dementia, late stage of of dementia. He doesn't remember his wife's name. He comes every Sunday and he worships. He remembers the worship music, believe it or not. Hmm. Um, He doesn't bring much in terms of leadership ability or gifting to our church. But in the kingdom of God, he is as valuable to us as anybody else. And so I have been amazed as a pastor, and you probably have seen this too, how often we're many even good Christian people are willing to neglect kind of the elderly. And we almost have an ethic that you're past your prime, we're done with you, we'll move to the younger generation. And so I just think that reflects not the way the kingdom of God is, uh, is, is ordered. Hmm. So um, so someone picks up your book, what do you, what do you want them to, to gain or garner from, from the experience of reading it? You know, it's interesting to me, I've had people who are pro-life activists like me pick it up with the premise that this is going to be good. It's going to affirm my pro-life convictions, and it does. And then they'll come back to me and say, you know, I'm pro-life, I'm I'm anti-abortion, but this really helped me think differently about some other issues that maybe I didn't think well about. I've had other people say who are kind of more motivated by justice, you know, criminal justice reform, poverty, all those sorts of things, say, you know, I picked this up thinking this would affirm my convictions on those things, and it, and it did. But then I realized, you know, I can't be for justice if I'm not for justice for the unborn. Or it, it, You help me think about the way I think about biblical sexuality. So my hope is just to kind of, uh, whoever picks it up, however your entrance is, to kind of just have a, come away with a more, a more complete vision of what the Bible says it means to be human. Now, um... Some people will say that all this concern for um, for policy, for politics, for for justice, for social justice, if you want to use that phrase, some people will say, well, we're not talking about social justice, we're talking about biblical justice, we could get into that debate and that discussion, that somehow that gets us off the track with reference to what uh, we should be about. We should be about the Great Commission and the Gospel, et cetera. Um, how, do you, how do you put those those kinds of views together with with your discussion on human dignity well well, i really talk about that in the second chapter when i talk about the kingdom of god um and i think this issue this debate we're having about you know just gospel proclamation or uh you know social action and if you really started the life of jesus he doesn't really allow you to to make that choice because you see on the one hand jesus saying um, to Nicodemus, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, to get into the kingdom of God, you have to have individual repentance by faith in, in Christ alone, right? Uh, you Otherwise, you can't get into the kingdom of God. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. On the other hand, Jesus also says, I'm the fulfillment of the prophecies that, that says the kingdom of God is good news for the poor. You see Jesus by his life demonstrating that. He says to the apostles of John, who are questioning, hey, are, are you are we sure we got the right guy here? He's saying, look at my actions. Are the, are the dead being raised? Are the lame walking? And so I think the gospel, uh, we both proclaim the gospel, that people can be reconciled to their creator because of Jesus, the one who created them in, in his image. And 
the gospel also restores us to our original image-bearing purposes, which is to um, image God in the world. And the church, you know, embodies the gospel by coming alongside the vulnerable. We, we show the world a glimpse of what the future kingdom will look like when we do this. And so I don't think you can separate the two. I don't know that we can obey the commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves if we don't do everything we can to help our neighbor, if we don't try to shape the social structures that affect our neighbor's flourishing. So uh, I, I think we it, it's both and. I think on the one hand, you have people who say, just preach the gospel and don't do any social action or don't speak out. The problem with that is um, there's been plenty of instances in history where people just preach the gospel, not said anything, and it kind of baptizes an unjust status quo. You know, in the antebellum South, you could pre a, preach a wonderful exegetical sermon, and the slave owner can go home and still beat his slaves and not feel like he's out of line. On the other hand, you have people who um, are all about social action without the individual gospel of repentance and faith. And without the power of God that changes people's lives, and they're sort of embarrassed by the exclusive nature of of Christ, of salvation in Christ. And so I think we need both, to be honest with you. And what and what doesn't one help build the credibility of the other? And what I mean here is um, that when I show that I care, about, when, when my message is, you know, God loves people and has given His Son to save them and cares about them, etc. When the church shows that care and shows that care in all areas of life to apply the point you're making in the book. A human being, no matter who they are, has dignity, deserves to be um, seen with dignity, deserves to be treated with dignity, deserves to be thought of through uh, lenses of dignity, etc. Uh, when we do that, we actually reinforce the idea that God cares for people. Certainly, Jesus gave himself for people who have dignity. And, and so the, the ultimate act of dignity was Jesus giving himself for, to, to redeem and to reclaim people who are lost on the one hand. But I show that, that, that the church believes in that message by how I care for, for my neighbor, how I live out the great commandment that my commitment to Jesus has called me into, because Jesus wouldn't call loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself as the great commandment, unless it were pretty important to do. That's exactly right. People, listen, the gospel is always going to be controversial, so there's no way to, to make it not controversial. But, you know, when we, when the church, the church is at her best, when she is standing alongside the most vulnerable, saying, hey, there's a person here. These people have value. Uh, and you look just throughout church history, despite of all of our mistakes, and, and sometimes we've been complicit in injustice or passive, but the church throughout her history has has often been the one to, to say to the people whom society is willing to discard, hey, these are people here. When we do that, um, we show the world what the king, the kingdom of God looks like and what our king is like. If we image the king, we're showing the people what our king is like. Our, you know, the Bible describes Jesus as a, as a king who's kind, who's loving, who loves people. Uh, that the kingdom of God is one of dignity and, and, and worth. And it's the, sort of the upside-down nature where the first will be last and the last will be first. So when we, in so much as the church does this, we, we show the world a glimpse of what the kingdom will look like. And we're an invitation uh, for people uh, to... To learn more about the king, um, and and I just think we also think about we're not just uh, souls that are happen to be in bodies because it's you know we need a vessel. God cares about body and soul, right? Jesus coming to Earth in the flesh tells us that human bodies are good, that that God cares about human bodies, He cares about human things. And so I, I think sometimes the church has a tendency to be a little bit almost neo-gnostic to say, like, all that matters is what's inside. But that's not what the life of Jesus demonstrates. And Jesus uh, died on the cross not only to save our souls, but to save our bodies. When he rose again the third day, he gives us the promise that one day we too will rise again, body and soul, like uh, in the end of the age. And so Jesus is not uh, neo-gnostic as much as we are sometimes. So, um, 
so so you've so you've written the book now and you've gotten a little bit of reaction uh what what do you i I often ask this question when someone writes a book like this because a book like this can be written and then afterwards you write it and you go oh you know what i didn't say this now that i've thought about it i wish i had added this touch or that touch to it something like that i know i have one book in particular i think of this way that walks right into the same space and when I was done and afterwards, about a year down the road, I was, I was sitting there saying, oh, man, if I, could, if I were rewriting this book, here would be something I would say that I didn't manage to say when I wrote it. Do you have anything like that that you, that you see or, or sense about what it is that you've done here? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think um, – I mean, I couldn't cover every topic as it relates to human dignity, I kind of wanted to set the tone and get people thinking and have an ethic. You know, the, the the topics 20 years from now may be different than the ones we talk about today. So there was a lot of sort of uh, issues that I couldn't touch on. I wanted to go a little more in depth uh, on things like, you know, uh, health care or sexual assault or, or some of the things that have kind of risen up even in, in, since I've written the book. Um, but I do think I gave people an ethic and a grid through which to think about issues that aren't even mentioned in the book. And so hopefully that will kind of be a guide. But you know how it is when you write a book and you're like, man, I should have said this or I should have said that, you know? And then our books would be like 400 pages, right? <laughs> or we issue them in, in annual editions or something like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So so, um, so what, what is it that you're working on these days uh, in the relationship to the commission? Anything in particular that you all are focused on? Well, we are pretty excited about a few things. I mean, we're uh, we're getting ready for January for our Evangelicals for Life event, and uh, this is kind of where we flesh out some of the things I wrote in the book. We've been doing this for a few years. We gather because it's the um, March for Life, uh, which kind of is the march to say, hey, the unborn unborn lives matter. Uh, but we're also trying to teach pro-life people how to have a holistic, whole life, pro-life ethics. So we're, we care about the unborn, but we also care about the immigrant, the elderly, uh, and every every everybody in between. And so we're, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, it's going to be right before uh, the March for Life, January, uh, I believe, 17th. Um, and so we, we have a pretty good uh, lineup that's coming. Uh, it's at McLean Bible Church there in D.C., so it should be, should be a good turnout. We've been doing this for a few years. We're pretty excited about it. So is... Um is that a, is that an annual conference that you all have that that or or is this a special themed conference? No, it's an annual conference. We do this every year. We've been doing it. This I think our fifth one. Uh, we've been doing it every year, right around the March for Life. And one of the other motivate motivations is this: is that, and you've probably been to the march. It, it's really a great thing. And when you get there, that's it's mostly Catholic people, which I'm so grateful for, for the Catholics before evangelicals did on this issue and you know have given us some great social teaching uh but we'd like to see more evangelicals there to say we too care about the dignity of human life and we care to care about uh the unborn and so we're trying to rally young evangelicals in particular and, and trying to get you know two groups that seemingly don't always talk to each other folks who uh, are pro-life uh and work in that space and folks folks who are pro-justice and work in that space and say we really need to be both. We we can do both of these things at the same time. Well, I want to thank you, Dan, for coming in and talking to us uh, about this. Uh, the theme of dignity is very important. I think it does form an important theological backdrop for how you think about a wide array of issues, and, and your book certainly uh, roams through those spaces. I mean, I'm just sitting here looking at the table of contents, and you've got... Um, race in the nations, you've got the start of life, you've got justice systems, you've got death, disease, and health care, work and poverty, identity, sexuality, and marriage, technology in the digital age, the whole issue of pluralism, the state, and religious liberty, and then finally a discussion on politics. And so it does kind of roam the roam the universe uh, of possibilities, and, and I think it sets a good tone for having us think through the theological grounding as we come into those areas. And I think you're right that there are, there are a lot of voices that we hear that are, that are uh, influenced by a variety of concerns, but, uh, but to actually have an approach that seeks to ground this 
these discussions in some theological base, in a theological base is really important. So I thank you for taking the time with us to discuss this and to kind of walk us through how you're thinking about it. Well, thanks for having me. And I really, again, appreciate uh, the discussion and uh, the interaction with the book and appreciate all, all the work. And I've always admired you and looked up to all you know, the work that you're doing and and I've read your commentaries for years, so thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, glad to be on here. Well, well, thank you very much, Dan. And and uh, well, I'm sure we'll there'll be other topics that we'll get to come back and talk to you all, uh, you and and the commission about. And appreciate your giving us your time. And we thank you for joining us on the table. And we hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.